Hey everyone, Duke Nuka 3D here, visiting Moulage's collection, and I'm going to be going over a few of the particularly interesting masks in his collection to kind of show off for you guys and further discuss. And this is one that I've been wanting to do for a while, and I kind of wish that he was here, or I, I should wait until he's back um, to sort of do the review together, but this one I'm just way too eager to do. I if, if, I if I make any mistakes in regards to the industrial aspects of this mask, you can feel free to correct me in the comments later, but anyhow, what we have here is a one-of-a-kind example of an industrialized cop's T-cell mask. Um, I'll open up the case and show it off here in a second, but the cop's T-cell um, was aptly named because it was designed by Waldemar Kops, uh, Major Waldemar Kops of the U.S. Chemical Warfare Service, who had previously designed the Richardson Flory and Kops mask, which was probably the most produced mask the U.S. made during World War I. But uh, the Kops Tiso was essentially his take on how to mass produce a Tiso style mask for the U.S. military due to shortcomings with the Akron Tiso being very difficult to produce and very complicated to manufacture, uh, so on and so forth. And the Cops Tiso had two main things going for it. One, it was slightly easier to produce. Two, it was more ergonomic. But the Cops Tiso was, had a very severe flaw with it. It was the fact that instead of being a molded rubber face piece such as the uh, AT was, the Cop Tiso was several layers of stockinette uh, and cotton sailcloth material that had rubberized layers in between that were very thin, and so the face piece was very gas permeable. And not only that, but tests shown um, that the face piece did leak on most occasions, and the seemingly good fit and seal of the mask was simply due to the fact that the face piece fabric was absorbing most of whatever chemical agents were leaching inside of the face blank. So to put it in WC Gear's um, own quotes, the mask had too little rubber and too much fabric. Um, and the face piece sort of acted as an auxiliary canister, as he sort of described it. But Anyhow, subsequently, the mask was very poor recepted as soon as the Cops, Tiso, and Monroe mask came out, and that essentially set the market post-war for what a lot of industrial masks would become, with MSA having the Burel Cops type style masks, and a lot of others taking influence off the KTM as well, such as the Davis Safety Company and uh, Acme to a certain degree. Uh, but anyhow, there were a few people that did attempt to make use of the surplus KTs, and this is one such example, and probably the only existent example of a post-war industrialized eight, I mean KT. So, looking at the box, you can see that it says Yablik Gas Mask, and I know Max Yablik was heavily involved with the Chemical Warfare Service. He had patented several various um, components to gas masks, notably the the M5 Connell valve, um, which is seen on a lot of masks from this period, and uh, a couple other things as well. Moulash tells me that he also patented this trunk, uh, which I, I need to look into myself, but I'll take his word on it. Opening it up, you can see the whole assembly inside, where it has the KT style mask and two cupramite canisters, which are, I believe, are just a bunch of fucking silica gel inside the canister. There's really nothing to them. And looking at the instruction label, which I'll end up needing to scan while I'm here, because this is uh, very interesting. As you can see, it shows uh, a Akron Tiso Type B face piece uh, instead of a KT, which is peculiar, but got to have some variety in there. So I would assume that this set um, compri was comprised of mostly surplus masks. Um, but anyhow, more onto this face piece, because this is a huge mishmash of various components, not only like, I can't even tell what on here is legitimately military and which is post-war industrial added on, because, um, so, you can see that the face piece, you can see that there's multi-layer material, um, you can see right here there's the, what would have been a flexible face seal of stockinette, and then you had the stiffened, reinforced cotton sailcloth layer, and all of its, all the seams are covered with fabric tape, you can see the brass angle or elbow tube on the nose area of the mask and you can see the flutter valve where or what where, where it was rather uh, on the chin the head harness is complete 
uh, I, I don't even know. This is not the original harness. This is completely replaced post-war. Um, I don't know what this would have originally been off of. It's, it might be purpose-made just for this kit. But the way I can tell it is added on later is there are several spots on the mask. You can see right there, sort of, um, just wherever the new harness here is riveted on, you can see remnants of the old stitching of the previous harness, which would have been a sort of self-centering style harness that the, like the AT used. Um, the eyepieces are not original to this mask either, I would assume, because um, looking at the inside, you can see how crudely they're stamped, and the fact that they have uh, a metal washer as opposed to just a... Well, I mean, all of them had the metal washer, but this one is... Um, has that sort of parkerized black finish to it. It's very weird, and also the gaskets inside the eyepieces are orange, and that is almost never seen, and I don't want to say almost even, because I've never seen CE-type eyepieces with those orange gaskets. And then also the flutter valve here. Um, the early KTs, um, they did not, uh, most of the early KTs had the flutter valve arranged so that the valve guard bracket was clamped around the wire and tape, whereas the later ones, um, they did have lugs for a bolted-on uh, flutter valve assembly, but the lugs were cast into the assembly itself, whereas with this example, um, those lugs are a separate stamped piece of steel, and then the flutter valve guard is just a piece of strip steel, and it's not any stamped um, component at all. It's very simple, and therefore, the whole assembly here is completely made up just for this example. And one would wonder in what state they got this mask before they modified it. Uh, the thing that's really throwing me off is the markings. You can see there's a size stamp here, but that font on the size 3, I've never seen a military mask use that font for the size stamp. So I'm wondering if the face piece was made off of government spec specifications or if they just happened to have a spare face blank that they added all these random parts to. You can see the... KT stamp for COPS TSO, um, number 25, and, uh, 42, I don't know what those reference, could be a batch number, could be a lot of a serial code, I'm not entirely sure. Um, can't really see much other markings on the mask. Looking inside the face piece again, which again is very hard to do because this mask is solid as a rock, and I've been sort of urging Moulage for me to try some softening procedures for this, but we're kind of, uh, we don't want to at the current moment, just because, again, this is the one example we have of industrialized KT, but anyhow, looking inside the face piece, you can see the, uh, another stamp there, 156, uh, which again, I'm not entirely sure what it is, probably a batch number or something, uh, you can see the, what would have been an elasticated, I think, elasticated chin strap, instead of a chin rest like the AT used, and then the deflector system, um, you can see is almost identical to the ATs. This is not how most KTs would have been, where it was a essentially a cone-shaped piece of rubber that was kind of folded inwards, and then that was what was the deflector system. But this is has a sort of brass Y piece, where they basically ch took a set of AT deflectors and chopped the two ends off, the two Y pieces, and just stuck them on this brass tube, um, because the hardware on a KT, I assume, and this could be very wrong, we don't, don't know for sure, but the elbow tube and the outlet valve are threaded, so these can be unscrewed, but I assume they're glued in place, and I really don't want to attempt to unscrew these, because I'm probably going to damage the mask. And another way I can tell that these deflectors are off of an AT, other than the fact that they are perfectly straight across the top, is the fact that they have a stockinette strip backing them, and that is an indicator that, uh, because all ATs, they had a stockinette strip on their deflectors so that the deflectors could be glued to the inside of the face piece. Um, but really that's all there is to see in regards to the face piece. Um, there is the hose, which is completely petrified, and then the canister latch, which is pretty much only seen on refrigeration type masks, like any industrial masks intended for refrigeration, at least early ones, they'll have a, a clamp similar to that. Um, but anyhow, that's really all there is I have to mention about this. I've covered all my bases, and it's just a very weird example of a KT that's sort of Frankensteined together out of random parts. So um, that being said, that's all I have to say again. Um, if, if you have any comments, questions, corrections, or concerns, drop them down in the comments below. I'll try to get some more reviews while I'm here at Moulage's place, and I'll see you all later.